Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Filter. On this show, we recognize that the world can be a confusing place to live in. And so what I seek to do on this show is to equip you to live with biblical clarity in our confusing world so that you can face the chaos of life with wisdom, integrity, and courage. I'm glad to welcome back to the show today, Dr. Glenn Sunshine. If you've been following this show for a while, uh, he is a familiar name to you. This is his third episode here with us on Filter. But for those of you guys uh, who uh, Dr. Sunshine is new for you, I'll read his bio before we get started. Uh, Glenn Sunshine is a former professor of history at Central Connecticut uh, State University, a ministry associate at Reflections Ministries, and a senior faculty member of the Colson Fellows. An award-winning author, Glenn has published books, articles, and book chapters on history, theology, and culture uh, online and on both sides of the Atlantic. His book, Why You Think the Way You Do, received the 2006 Acton Institute Book Grant. Glenn has also taught courses on four continents. Glenn, welcome back to the podcast. Glad to be back. Well, glad to have you on. So every year around Christmas and Easter, we hear uh, some conversations that go on in Christian circles about you know, maybe it's uh, not in mainstream circles, maybe necessarily, but in some circles, we hear these, these conversations about uh, should we be celebrating these holidays? Because uh, while we all agree that the birth and resurrection of Jesus are worth ce- celebrating, there's people who claim, well, these holidays have pagan roots. And, sh- and so uh, we as Christians should have nothing to do with them. That's Christmas and Easter. Halloween seems to be a whole different story because this one, uh, on the very surface of it, appears to uh, be pagan, uh, you know, occultic, or just anti-Christian. And so I wanted to have you on the show so that we could talk about uh, this holiday and uh, and get a, an historical perspective and try to think through it wisely as Christians living today. So um, talk to us about the history of this holiday particularly its interaction and you know relevance to christian history okay well first of all let me just note that christmas easter and halloween all of them have christian roots none of them have pagan roots let's just start off with that (laughs) all right (laughs) okay so um the um we have to actually go back to the early church um when people were martyred, it was thought to be appropriate to honor these saints, these people who had given their lives for the faith. And so what would happen is the anniversary of their deaths became the Saint Day. So St. Patrick, for example, died on March 14th, um, and so on, because this was, this was the day that they were translated into heaven. Okay. So we have saint days developing in the early church as a way of commemorating the martyrs. But then the question came up, well, what about all the martyrs who are anonymous? Uh, what about saints who weren't martyred, but who, were, who are genuine saints? What, what, shouldn't we do something to commemorate them? And so a feast, which would eventually be called All Saints Day, Day, all Saints Day was started. Now, mm-hmm. All Saints Day was originally celebrated in Italy the week after Pentecost, the Sunday after Pentecost. Um, It later got moved to, I believe it was May 13th. Um, But then in around the 8th century or so, um, it was moved to November 1st. And that move aligned All Saints Day in Italy and frankly also within the Frankish Empire with the date that was used in Ireland uh, and in the Celtic Church to commemorate the saints. Hmm. So you have the Saints Day intended to commemorate the faithful departed, um, moved to November 1st. Uh, then along with that, the Pope, it was Boniface, uh, Bonif- uh, no, it wasn't Boniface. Gregory the Third, I think it was. Anyway, the Pope ended up moving the uh, well, along with moving the date to November first. He also declared the evening before 
to be a a festival you know in preparation for the celebration of all saints so that uh, in england all saints day was known as all hallows hallows from holy from you know saint means holy one um mm-hmm. so that became mm-hmm. all hallows eve or halloween it was specifically the evening of preparation before the celebration of the feast of all saints then we add from there uh, the Abbey of Cluny, which was a very important monastery in medieval France, uh, decided that we really needed a day to commemorate the souls who, well, by their theology, were in purgatory. You know, these are people who will eventually end in end up in heaven, but they're not there yet. They're in purgatory, being prepared, purged. Um, uh, in preparation for entry to heaven. So we needed a, mm-hmm. a, a day to celebrate that. And so they added All Souls Day on November 2nd. So you celebrate All Saints Day on the 1st, All Souls Day on the 2nd. And then the evening before this is the Feast of All Saints. Excuse mm-hmm. me, the Feast of All Hallows Eve. Mm-hmm. So uh, so that that's how the holiday develops. And it was an important holiday. It's a, a triduum, a three-day holiday. It's an important triduum throughout medieval Europe um, into, well, into um, early modern Catholicism as well. Um, yeah, so Catholic this is all... Church still celebrates All Saints and All Souls Day. So this is all pre-Reformation, what well, we've... All of this is pre-Reformation. Okay. Yeah. And so um, you said... The you said November 1st. The with All Souls Day should, should clue you in on that one. So this yeah. is all, all in the medieval church before the Reformation, Yes. Yeah, so yeah, because we've just flown through several centuries really fast, so I'm trying to make sure I'm uh, hanging along with you. So we're still pre-Reformation. You said they eventually landed on November 1st in accordance with the Celtic uh, dating for it. What was their significance in the Celtic tradition for placing that holiday in that time of year, and why did they adopt that? You know, I know that Celtic Christianity was extremely influential, um, and that's one of the things I learned from you uh you know throughout this period but something that a lot of people don't appreciate so was there do you know what what, what was was there a reasoning there for that yeah i have not been able to track down the reasoning why they were celebrating uh the martyrs on november 1st however at this point we have to talk about um the the cultural festivals that were held in uh, in well, actually, all across the world, but specifically within the Celtic world, there's a holiday that takes place right around the, uh, this time of year, right around October, November uh, transition. That's called Solon. Uh, it's pronounced slightly differently depending on where you are, but it's never spelled like it sounds. It's S A M H A I N. It looks like Samhain, but it's pronounced Solon. Okay, now Solon. Uh, people will tell you that Halloween is a basically a thin veneer uh, over Samhain celebrations, and it was actually pagan in origin. That's what you're going to hear. And they're going to connect it to the Druids and everything else. Okay, so what's going on? We actually know remarkably little about Samhain. There is really almost no documentation on what it was or how it was done. However, there are ceremonies all around the world at roughly this time of year, in the Northern Hemisphere at least, that mark the end of the harvest season. And what we do know about Samhain is it was a harvest festival. And as a harvest festival, there were a number of things that would be done. You know, the, it, it's the end of gathering and all the grain, but you're also preparing for winter. So uh, animals were, uh, were butchered. Um, Uh, livestock were killed uh, to stock up meat for the winter. And you can't keep them alive anyway, you know, with the snow and all of that. So uh, the animals were killed, presumably salted or in other ways preserved, uh, smoked maybe, whatever. Uh, We also know that they did bonfires. Um, Now, the bonfires were probably celebration, uh, but also, you know, perhaps it had something to do with simply making the day longer so that they had more time to get their work in. But one way or another, it was a festival, a harvest festival characterized by uh, the two things we're sure of are uh, are killing livestock for uh, storing up meat for the winter 
uh, and the bonfires. There appears we have no record of there being any religious significance to this. Okay. Now, there are two things that we might want to add into this to understand why the Irish picked this date for uh, a, a feast of, uh, of all saints. One of them is biblical. Uh, the image of the harvest is used by Jesus and a number of other places to depict the end of the age, the point at which the resurrection will occur, Christ will return, and all of that. And so having this at, the, at, at a harvest festival makes sense on a biblical level. Okay, so we have that. Uh, the other thing, though, that is worth noting is that it appears that the uh, the Celtic peoples, and again, along with a lot of others, uh, believed that there were certain times of the year uh, that were, if you will, thin times, times in which the the this world and the other world, uh, the the veil between them thins. Mm -hmm. so that there's a potential for interaction across it. Mm -hmm. So um, w w thin times occur at transitions. So dawn and dusk, okay, would be examples of thin times. Thin times during the year occur not just on solstices and equinoxes, and not even mainly on those, but on the halfway point between the solstice and the equinox. Thus, around November 1st, the end of the harvest season was what they considered the beginning of winter, uh, which makes the solstice actually literally midwinter. Um, February, roughly Groundhog Day, uh, is the beginning of spring. Uh, roughly May 1st is the beginning of summer, which makes June 21st the solstice midsummer, and so on. So these things that are halfway between the solstices and the equinoxes were, it seems, thought of as thin times, where it might be possible to interact more, or people from the other world or beings from the other world can more easily interact with us. And it may be that there was a connection with that as just sort of an appropriate way of thinking about the saints uh, who were believed to actually be active in the affairs of men. Um, or it may have been an attempt to say, actually, no, we don't need to worry about the other world. We should really be focused not so much on the fairies and things like that, but on the saints who are in the other world and who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. So there are a couple of ways that you could you could interpret this, but with the absence of any real sources explaining why November 1st was chosen, at least none that I've been able to find, uh, it's kind of up for grabs, uh, which it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. And uh, for those listeners who've been with the podcast for a while, the idea of thin places might sound familiar to you because Oz Guinness wrote a book uh, last that came out earlier this year called uh, Signals of Transcendence. And mm -hmm. in the book, he talks about uh, the Irish idea of, of thin places uh, where, where our world and the unseen world can uh, come closer together. And so it's interesting to hear that idea uh, playing out again in another way. But, uh, but yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, and yes, yeah, so let's move forward to the Reformation. Once we get into that era and things are changing with the Protestant Reformation in Europe, uh, how does that change this holiday or perceptions of this holiday uh, once we move into that period? Well, within the Protestant world, except in places that are still uh, like the, well, the Anglican Church, um, uh, which maintains many of the older holidays, in most of the Protestant world, these holidays vanish. Uh, the idea that everyone who is a believer is a saint, uh, the idea that intercession to the saints, praying to the saints, uh, is uh, is not something we need to do because Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. Um, the idea of purgatory disappears. So for the most part, celebrations of All Saints Day, All Souls Day, and All Hallows Eve 
fall into disuse. Again, in the Anglican world, you still have all saints and all souls um, frequently, but it is not really particularly a major holiday. And with the Reformation, these, along with many other uh, Roman Catholic holidays and celebrations, just simply uh, fall into disuse. Uh, Halloween doesn't actually become anything significant really culturally within the Protestant world, literally until the 20th century. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Um, so so how did it become what we know of it today as you know, like the, the, the cultural holiday? Okay, well, I suppose really we have to start in the 19th century. Uh, and I, giving my footnotes here, uh, there's been a lot of really good work on this done by Stephen Wedgworth. Uh, at uh, he published uh, at Ad Fontes here, and he's done some really good digging into the history of this. Um, the the first thing that happens is, you know, you don't really see, you know, anything spooky or whatever surrounding Halloween, All Hallows Eve, um, at all, until you're getting into the 19th century. And in the 19th century, you have people carving for the first time jack-o'-lanterns. They don't predate the 19th century. Um, and you have these this sort of a, a romantic reimagining of the past where they invent all sorts of stories and connections and so on. And many of these end up being kind of spooky. And then these are gradually attached into Halloween. Um, now, I should note one other thing that I neglected to mention. The association with the dead um, and a point at which, you know, the dead might be able to interact with the living or whatever. Um, there are other things that you can point to here. So, for example, on May 13th, the original date for All Saints, that corresponded to the Roman feast of Lemuria, where it was believed that uh, evil ghosts could could re-enter the world. You know, so there is a sense there, and perhaps with the Celtic thing of this thin place, a place to go across. And of course, you have the Day of the Dead in Mexico, which is right around basically the same time. Yeah. You know, so there are other cultures in which this association with All Saints, or particularly um, Halloween, uh, this year, this uh, time period, there are other cultures in which this is uh, this is strong, uh, but in the Anglo-Saxon world, you only really begin seeing this, particularly in America, uh, with the advent of uh, you know, so like this, this sort of 19th century romantic uh, reading, you know, actually inventing stories and and connections and things like that to the past that never really existed. Um, the first association with the Druids came from a woman, I forgot her name off the top of my head, who who wrote a piece that was intended to be kind of fun, in which she ended up associating Halloween with the Druids. It's the first mm -hmm. time we ever see that even happening, is the latter part of the 19th century. Hmm. Uh, when you move into the 20th century, um, you get the beginnings in the 1930s of trick-or-treating. There's really nothing like that earlier. You know, people will talk about mumming. They'll talk about uh, something called souling and things like that. These don't seem to have had any association with Halloween. Trick-or-treating starts in the 1930s as a way of keeping older children out of mischief. Mm -hmm. And it starts in America and Canada and then gradually spreads elsewhere. Um, so you have, you know, you, so you got this association of, of, um, you know, starting late 19th century or mid to late 19th century into the 20th century, you're beginning to get an association of spookiness with Halloween, but it's kind of a campy, fun kind of spookiness. It's not really serious. It's not really, um, focused on death and gore and all of those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Wedgworth actually tracks that to the growth of movies like Halloween, um, Friday the 13th, all of these sort of slasher horror movies that started becoming popular. 
Yeah. Uh, that is where he sees the beginning of Halloween being transformed from just sort of a goofy, fun kind of thing with a little sort of play spooky elements to something that is really grounded in horror. Mm-hmm. And along with that, um, transitioning from being a holiday for the little kids to go out and and hit up the neighbors for some candy into something that is celebrated really overwhelmingly by adults. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so before we get into, you know, the practical question of what do you, how should Christians approach and be involved in something like Halloween, let's just think about Halloween as it currently is today. Uh, it's currently is celebrated and perceived today, uh, you know, on, on a worldview level and just say, how should Christians, uh, view Halloween as it celebrated today in terms of, uh, these themes of, uh, of death, um, and evil forces and whatnot, uh, you know, through the lens of a Christian worldview, how do, how should we view it and what should we say about it? Um, you know, in, in this culture. Well, what, what, uh... On one level, um, the church has really since uh, at least the Middle Ages and probably earlier argued for the importance of what is known as memento mori, um, reminders that you are going to die. And the point of the memento mori is you have to pay attention to how you're living now because you are approaching death. It's going to happen. You don't know when. And you want to make sure that you are living your life in such a way that you're ready for it. Um, Thus, if you look at a lot of still life paintings, you know, from the, the Dutch, the great Dutch still life paintings, what you will see frequently is they'll have a skull there uh, on the table, or there will be a blown out candle, which is a reminder that, well, what, what does uh, Shakespeare say? Out, out brief candle. Um, it, it, I was in a church, uh, an old line uh, Puritan church that uh, that we worshipped in when I was living in Connecticut. And on the pulpit, nobody understood the significance of this, but on the pulpit, there was a candle and an hourglass. Both of them were memento mori. And the point being that when you looked up at the pulpit, you were reminded of the fact that you were mortal, that death was coming, and what happens afterwards depends on how you hear what is being proclaimed from the word. So this idea of reminding people of the reality of death is not a bad thing. And it's something that's got long, uh, very honorable roots within the Christian tradition. The problem is that the way it is being done in, uh, you know, I, I can take you to places nearby um, in my neighborhood here or, or in South Bend. The way it is being done, it's almost a, a, a reveling in death, decay, gore, all of those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah, darkness. And, and yeah. that, I think, is seriously unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, th- these are not things we should be celebrating and rejoicing in. It's one thing to, you know, to to act with the idea of a memento mori. It's a, it's another idea to just sort of glory in this kind of stuff, and that I would argue is a real problem. And I think it, it's connected as well to the tendency in um, costumes, Halloween costumes, toward over sexualization. You know, you get sexy vampires, sexy nurses, sexy, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, the, this association of sex and death, um, the connection between the two, is something that is recognizable to anybody who knows much about mythology and folklore. You know, you can go back to uh, Asherah. Uh, also known as Inara or Ishtar in uh, the ancient Sumerian world, who is a goddess of sex and death. Hmm. You know, so so there there's there is, I think, an an unhealthy, a, a seriously unhealthy um, trend in the culture um, that is pulling all of these various kinds of things together. 
uh, in a way that is really a celebration of of the perverse and the macabre. Hmm. Um, and I think what it says, frankly, is that the culture is really, in terms of worldview, the culture has lost its way. I don't have yeah. a problem with the idea of trick or treating. I don't have a problem with kids dressing up in costumes or whatever, as long as the costumes are appropriate. Um, you know, that, that doesn't bother me. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Um, and actually, it's a nice way, if you've got kids in your neighborhood, it's a nice way of making contact with the kids and their parents, which is something that is really hard to do in a culture dominated by garage doors. Yeah. So there, there are some positive things. There's some good ways that Halloween can be used to make connections to, you know, to make friends, you know, to, to get to know people who are coming around, especially if they're from your neighborhood. Uh, or if you're bringing your kids around, it's a way of, of saying hello to the neighbors. We don't get much chance to do this. We, we open the garage door, we drive the car, and we close the garage door, all done by remote. And yeah. we never really tend to see our neighbors. So there's, there are some positive things here that are possible. Yeah. But the overall cultural trend, I think, is harmful, and I would even add destructive, because it it is, in fact, a celebration of all that is perverse, of death, decay, zombies, all of these kinds of things. And that, and that I, I think that that says a lot about the state of our culture, that it's reveling in this kind of stuff. Halloween is second mm -hmm. only to Christmas in terms of the amount of money spent to celebrate it. Really? And the vast majority of that money isn't buying candy for the kids. It's buying 10 foot tall skeletons that you can put outside your house. Yeah. You know, or, or blow out parties or, you know, or whatever. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So Halloween has always been probably my least favorite holiday. Just one that I was never really, you know, interested in, uh, not, not for any particular reason. Um, just my per you know, uh, personal, uh, you know likes um but you know but my daughter's really into it uh she's six years old and it's just because she likes to dress up in mm -hmm. fun little cute outfits and she likes candy um so since having her and now we're doing trick-or-treating and she gets excited about halloween coming up it's made me more aware of how halloween is celebrated around and and i've noticed what you said before and uh and it is extremely concerning and i agree i don't have any problem with the fun, campy kind of, you know, uh, celebration, like you said before, fun, lighthearted trick or treating that's silly. Um, but it's hard to go trick or treating anywhere these days because each year we'll kind of go to a friend's neighborhood and we all go together um, to walk around. And inevitably, there's always one or two houses that you just have to skip or pass by or not even go down the block because there's a. Um, and not to sound overly mystical or anything here, but there's, there's a strange darkness around it. You know, mm -hmm. the people, the people there are, uh, they're not being silly. They are, like you said before, reveling in something dark and grotesque. It's, it's yeah. very, very concerning. So, yeah. So to kind of sum up what you said, you know, memento mori, uh, confronting the reveling in darkness. And I think one thing that I would add whenever I think about, this holiday and a biblical worldview is I just, what comes to mind is, is, is Paul saying, Oh, death, where's your sting? And how, because of the gospel and the resurrection, we can look at, you know, this holiday that where, where death is kind of at the center of it and say, because of the resurrection, we can uh, look at it and, and have a silly, you know, fun, more lighthearted uh, experience around this holiday where death is at the center because we know that there's the hope of the resurrection. So, you know, I don't know if that's the most appropriate application. But that's one thing that comes to my mind. Yeah. Now, there is one other dimension of this, though, that we we probably should mention. Uh, and that's the fact that we're in, in our culture, we're seeing a rise of neo-paganism in a variety of different forms. Um, roughly you can divide the the they don't like the term neo-pagan uh they like modern pagan or pagan with a capital p as opposed to old paganism which is paganism with a, with a lowercase p but whatever you want to call it we're seeing a resurgence of attempts to resurrect ancient religions 
And there, broadly speaking, there are two kinds of these. There, there are some that there are various terms that are used for it. I like uh, eclectic for the first one. Uh, this would be things like Wicca, uh, which is a new religion, really started, the roots of it are really only in the early 20th century, however much they may claim antiquity. They, they, the better ones have sort of moved away from that particular claim. But um, they truly believe that there is spiritual power associated with these thin times and thin places. They truly believe that in their worship and in their rituals, they can tap into this and use this for, for their purposes in working magic and so on. Uh, the other ones are what I sometimes call ethnic, technically they're reconstruction uh, paganists, pagans. Um, these are people who are trying to resurrect specific ancient religions. Uh, the Druids were the early popular one. Nowadays, it's largely heathenism, which is the uh, Norse gods and Germanic gods. But many of these reconstructionist groups are also tied into, you know, they're frequently, as is true of most paganisms, associated with nature, and therefore they're tuned in with, uh, with seasons and holidays and things like that around the solstices and the in-between times and so on. So there is, in fact, although historically you can't really make a real connection between magic and witchcraft and things like that and Halloween, historically, that you know, the closest you get is Samhain, and that's a harvest festival with no indication of any occult significance. Mm -hmm. There is an occult significance that is being brought in by these various pagan groups. Uh, the irony being that they are claiming that Christians took their holiday when in point of fact, what they're doing is paganizing a Christian holiday. Yeah. So we should, we, uh, that's one thing that, d that ought to be mentioned, mm. uh, uh, in connection with, with this particular subject, you know, the, the pagan world is, and, I, and when I'm using the word pagan, I'm not using it just in the sense of anybody who doesn't believe in God. I'm using it in its specific technical sense of people who believe in these other gods. Um, the pagan world has really adopted this as one of their, their the highlights, the center points of their year. Yeah. And along with the spiritual darkness associated with the reveling in death, and so on, there's another kind of spiritual darkness that is attached to the, the pagan approaches to this time of year as well. And we, we should at least acknowledge that that's out there too. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think whatever side of the fence you're on in regards to how should we view and should we participate in this, it's hard to take just a um, an unnuanced stance on either one where there's, oh, we should just embrace it and not worry about it, or on the other side say, no, it's absolutely horrible from top to bottom. Uh, because whenever we consider the history uh, and the the worldview analysis here, there's there's you know some careful things that needs to be done. So in light of uh, the, the history of this holiday and, but, you know, the kind of paganizing of it in our culture today now, what would be your answer to how should we uh, approach it and participate in this holiday? Uh, is it is it worth trying to reclaim, or is this something that we should just abstain from? Um, uh, should we create an alternative? What, what how do we should we participate? Well, the alternative that most churches create is to do a harvest festival, which ironically enough is going back to what Samhain originally was. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, the irony there is really is, is really. Yeah. Uh, kind of sharp. Uh -huh. um, I, I think this is one of these areas that I would describe as adiaphora. It, it, it's an indifferent matter. If you are going to celebrate Halloween, you should do it in a way that is appropriate, that that is honoring to God. Um, and, uh, you know, I, like I said, I don't have a problem with trick-or-treating or things like that. I would encourage you, if you're going to do that, to keep to your neighborhood. And the reason for, if at all possible, and the reason for that is because it's a way of connecting with your neighbors, which is something we don't do. So um, 
Yeah, and definitely uh, if you've got kids trick-or-treating, give them good candy. You want to be known as the guy who gives out full-size candy bars, okay? That, that gives you a lot of cred. Uh -huh. okay. And, and I'm, I am dead serious about this. I am talking about how do you use the activities around this holiday for kingdom purposes. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the first steps of this is building, building relationships with neighbors. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you're going to celebrate it, that's what I would encourage you to do. Um, if you want to avoid any hint of the... Um, you know, the, well, frankly, demonic elements that have crept into the holiday, um, the, the church could, could throw, you know, just do a harvest thing, you know, and you can have many of the traditional activities that are associated with Halloween celebrations, except you do them in the context of a harvest. You know, there's nothing wrong with pumpkin carving. There's nothing wrong mm -hmm. with bobbing for apples, which I don't know if anybody really does anymore. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things that were done around Halloween um, Halloween parties that you can just simply transfer into a, uh, a harvest thing. If you've got people who are hung up by the um, the way the holiday has morphed over the years um, and who have yeah. bought into the misinformation about where it comes from. Yeah. Yeah, there's, and there's a lot of And if you don't want to celebrate it, don't. If you don't think this is a good idea, uh, if you think I'm out to lunch here, do not do it. Whatever yeah. is not a faith is sin. If you can't do this with a good conscience, don't do it at all. Yeah. That's the yeah. only other thing I'd add. That's good. That's good. So I guess the uh, the last question that we should ask before we, we close is, what are you going to be dressing up as for Halloween this year, Glenn? I'm going to be dressing up as a retired history professor. <laughs> Although I will tell you that the day after Thanksgiving, a friend of mine made me a red velvet hat with white trim. Oh. White fur yeah. around it. And I wear that from after Thanksgiving through Christmas. <laughs> so. Yeah. So you, you get your fill of dressing up uh, yeah. after Thanksgiving. Yeah, so you you don't yeah. need to do any extra dressing up. You know, I was yeah. hoping you're going to say Gandalf. It's actually kind of funny watching people's reaction, especially little uh -huh. kids. Oh, so, I bet. Anyway, I bet. I was hoping you were going to say Gandalf. I think you would make a great Gandalf for uh, for Halloween. Uh, maybe just you know, you you don't have the long gray hair, but uh, but but the beard and the look. I think that you would do well. Yeah, yeah. If I if I had the the robe and the hat, I could probably pull that off. But um, I didn't really think it was worthwhile to invest in that. Yeah, that's great. All right. Well, so you're just looking forward to Advent. That's great. Yep. All right. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoy every time I get to talk to you. It's always fascinating and uh, and fun. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us on Filter today to help us think well about this holiday and our culture and our place in it. So thank you for coming on the show. Thanks again for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope this episode provided you with biblical clarity to live with confidence in our confusing world. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch up the latest from me, you can go to my website, AaronChamp.com. While you're there, subscribe to my newsletter so that you can be updated anytime I share new content. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Aaron M. Champ. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Until then, hold fast to the end.